fundamental source of conflict in this new world will not be primarily ideological or primarily economic. Rather, Samuel Huntington asserted in his book, Clash of Civilizations, that the great divisions among mankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation states will remain the most powerful actors in world affairs, but the principal conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and groups of different civilizations. Moreover, the clash of civilizations will dominate global politics. The fault lines between civilizations will be the battle lines of the future. 27 years after this hypothesis was initially published, one may evaluate whether the world at large, and Europe in particular, is indeed embroiled in a clash of civilizations, as this view, which carries with it far-reaching ramifications, of course, is increasingly adopted by global political and military leaders. Good evening, I'm Jonathan Hessen, and this is the 17th edition of TV7 Europa Stands. Joining us to dissect Europe's state of internal and foreign affairs include retired General Klaus Naumann, who is Germany's former Bundeswehr Chief of General Staff and Chairman of NATO's Military Committee. Thank you for joining us, General. Pleasure to be here. Also joining us, Professor Czesek Czaputowicz, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland. Mr. Timo Soini, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs and Deputy Premier of Finland. Thank you. And Professor Miro Kovac, who is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Croatia. Thank you for joining us as well, sir. Thank let's, you. Let's start with uh, the, the chief question of today, which we will try and dissect as we go along the various topics. General, we'll start with you. Are we seeing a clash of civilizations today? I'm, I'm full of doubts, I should say. Uh, I think we are seeing a clash of two competing systems of order. One being our Western value-based system of a regulated world, and the other one, the aspirations of China to propose a new world order, which is not fully fleshed out yet, but they intend to be the dominating power in the world by 2050. That's what they stated. And they obviously wanted to be, uh, to, they want to offer a new system which is still weak, but which is based on their ideas, on their system of their Confucian values. Um, it's a systemic clash which we see at the beginning, and we are seeing the beginning of a new world order to be formed. Professor Djaputovic? I agree with the general uh, because, uh, yes, uh, countries are organized around uh, culture, civilizations, uh, definitely it's true. But when you look at current most important conflict or war, this is between Russia and Ukraine, and both countries are from the same civilization. There's a closeness between uh, Orthodox countries, both of them. So you cannot say that it is main divine decline. You can also argue that, first of all, within civilizations there are some competition uh, and accumulation of power, and you can interpret that uh, war in that way. But I agree that there is a competition between two kinds of uh, systems, authoritarian one on the one hand and this democratic one. When you look at the Western world, you see on the side of the West not only uh, Christian civilization countries, but also countries like Japan or Korea from different civilizations. So the, the value or their beliefs are more important than some uh, religious or cultural uh, relations. So I would not agree that this paradigm of Huntington applies today. Mr. Soini? I think that uh, the main competition is uh, between U.S. and China, and what what are under the surface is democracy, rule of law, uh, the, the the elections that you can really change the elected elite ministers, presidents, and then there are countries which have elections, but the, the but the same parties, the same per the persons are going to be elected again. That is the one. One thing. Then inside, for example, in Europe, there is a rivalry between globalism and populism inside the, the different member states, which way to lean. And, and, and that is also true. And, and then 
there is uh, the, the challenge of the other big countries, uh, which are not China and, 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 uh, and US are BRICS countries, which are huge in the pop population and they are in a way on, on the rise. And they are both authoritarian and democratic. And that's, that's a quite of the minister on soup. Interesting. Professor <laughs> Kovac? So what we have today basically is a clash between the West, led by the US, and uh, China on the other side. Um, uh, nation states are the chief actors in, in international politics. Hansen was right when it comes to that. There are some countries which are today opponents of the US, of the Western-led world, although they are, when it comes to civilization, they should be a part of the Western civilization, but they use this clash to gain more sovereignty, to enhance their, 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 their position in world politics, for instance, Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it's like in uh, Iran with, the, uh, uh, with their system. Their system was used to, um, to become more sovereign in world politics. Uh. So, um, because you could also argue that Iran and India should be with the West because of the connections between Europe, India, and Iran uh, when it comes to the languages. So, but today we have clearly a clash between the US and China, China being the leader of the non-Western world, and the US being the leader of the Western world, and the West should be much more efficient when it comes to organize, organizing itself to be able to cope in the long run in that battle uh, with uh, the rising Chinese and uh, Indians. Not to forget, of course, that Iran used to be part of the West uh, yes. under yes. the Shah, yeah. but yes. following the revolution, it shifted gears. General, I, I'd like to move to the next point, and that is, to what degree is this... Uh, rivalry or emerging rivalry of a multipolar system or a bipolar system, however you may look at it, uh, a clash between G7 and BRICS countries? I, uh, let me first of all make one point clear from the previous discussion. I think we are seeing a competition between two ideas. The one is the center of our thinking is the individual and its freedom to be protected. In the Chinese system, it's not the individual. It's a community, and the individual means nothing. The individual has to obey. And that, I think, is a big competition. A uh, clash between the G7 and, and others. Um, if I see it properly, we see, to some extent, if I may say so, a revolution against or a revolt against American dominance. That is what is behind this new movement uh, that some countries are applying for membership in the BRICS community. It, it means that these countries do not accept American leadership, which, which we accepted to our benefit. Mm -hmm. And we benefited tremendously from that uh, as a German I have to say, without the Americans, my country would never be there where it is today, despite, despite all problems. And yet in Germany today, we see a shift in popularity towards uh, a community that is not necessarily supportive of the transatlantic alliance and sees Russia as the natural uh, ally or partner. Well, let's see. Uh, that's, I should say, fortunately, is still a minority in Germany. It is, to some extent, the legacy of the former German Democratic Republic and this uh, reluctance to accept American leadership is primarily based in the east of Germany, the five new, uh, uh, new lenders. Um, the majority of the German people supports the idea of a rule-based democracy in which the freedom of the individual is protected by the power of the law. 
And this idea is the American idea. And for that reason, there is, I think, in Germany, no movement to move away from the transatlantic alliance. And if you look at the just uh, recently published national security strategy of Germany, it's clearly in one as it's clearly stating one aspect, and that is we will continue to be a reliable partner in the transatlantic world. Which is vital indeed, Professor yeah. Czaputovic. Very interesting um, what you uh, general said about this uh, Eastern Germany, because Poland and other countries like Baltic states were also under communist system, and we are very much pro-American for transatlantic strong links. I heard a saying that the Poles are the most pro-American country in the world, including the Americans. So <laughs> sometimes you can also um, uh, understand in that way, because for us it's very important their presence in Europe, the only power which can protect us and our region from the aggressive policy of, of Russia. So we are very much for transatlantic links. As far as Three countries are concerned, and G7, I think that, um, of course, G7, this is a grouping based on values, but it is a recognition also in the United States that this international system should also include these newcoming states, uh, powers. They should have uh, more understanding and better place in the system. And there is also an idea in the United States recently discussed maybe to enlarge the uh, Security Council of the United Nations to have some new uh, permanent members without veto power because consensus is very difficult to achieve. So uh, my conclusion from that uh, uh, assessment is that maybe we should also allow these countries, some of these uh, BRICS countries, at least, to have more influence, like India, like uh, like like so South Africa, the the democratic countries. I see the possibility to ha cooperate with these countries. For example, when you look at the European Union, a lot of attention is given to relations with India. Uh, recently, last uh, uh, two years, previously China was the main reference point, but uh, India is a very important country and democratic one. So. This is a closeness of values, of democracy, and the chance to develop uh, uh, closer relations. Despite the fact that India's Foreign Minister Jay Shankar came out and spoke uh, during the last uh, meeting of BRICS, also in Johannesburg, South Africa, highlighting that you know he does see China, Russia, Brazil uh, as partners of. Uh, and South Africa, of course, as, as India. But he, it seemed to me that he is also very wary of the fact that China and Russia are taking the lead in this composition. And the rivalry between India and China is quite significant, which indicates also the resentment of the West in the eyes of India and China, which aligns to a certain degree in that sense. Yes, I agree. So for India, it's, it is important to maintain good relations with the West, also due to the geopolitical competition with China. When I was a minister, Indian minister visited Warsaw, we had very good relations, also in the Security Council. I happened to chair the Security Council meeting in 2020 during the crisis over um, with Pakistan. So it was important to resolve this crisis. There is a lot of tension there in India and with the neighbors. And I think that for them, relations with the Western countries are very important. At the same time, also BRICS gives them a special status. And it's in their interest to maintain kind of a balanced policy. Um, but it's a realistic policy uh, based on Indian interest. And, but okay, we have common interests also with them. Indeed. Mr. Soini, I'd like actually to ask, yeah. next month uh, in August, there's going to be the meeting of BRICS leaders. Yeah. One of those people coming to India will be no other than Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, South Africa, as part of its commitments, is a signatory of the Rome Statute, which means that it is 
under uh, the, the various regulations and, and sightings of the yeah. International Criminal Court in The Hague, yeah. which has labeled Putin as wanted. Yeah, and, and if I have understood it right, uh, South Africa said that Putin cannot come to their soil. And, and that, is, uh, that is the big thing. And uh, of course, when we think about uh, BRICS and uh, G7, it was a shock for many Europeans to notice because we all thought that it was a brutal Russian invasion by force attack to Ukraine. And we thought that everybody would condemn that. But India, no. Brazil, no. Uh, China, no. And, and that was one of the big uh, wake-up calls to the Europe, that, uh, that uh, this is everything to us. But uh, not the whole world is looking at the situation at the same token. And I think that was a huge shock. And if we then look that uh, Western countries have been extremely vocal on human rights, when and who of the foreign ministers or pr uh, prime ministers of Western countries have criticized lately the human rights situation in China or in India? And I think this is something very notable that... Uh, that uh, uh, we haven't have somehow lost the confidence or changed uh, the strategy that we are not going to breathe our supremacy with human rights issues, which are, of course, like General Nauman said, individual is everything, and after that comes society. And in the totalitarian systems, System is everything, and individual is part of the system. And well, I think this is notable. I think it's important to know that the United States did that when the Biden administration entered office vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia. And yeah. now the Saudis have redirected their attention towards China. Yeah, but isn't there a logical mistake on the side of China and of India uh, when they more or less tolerate the Russian action? They always claimed that the sovereignty of the nation state is a sacred thing and that the, the protection of their territory yeah. is something which should never be violated by anyone. What Russia did is a blatant violation of the principle on which everything after World War II rested. Yeah. And that is... Uh, territory of a national state cannot be attacked and changed by force. China, India, they all claim that this is true, but suddenly they forgot it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can, I, can I say one more, one, one more thing about this, uh, which you raised up to Saudi Arabia and I Iran? Now their personal relations have uh, been uh, closing ties. And who is the midwife? China. More so, Saudi Arabia, Iran, yeah. United Arab Emirates, and many of those countries have also applied to join BRICS. Yes. Professor yeah. Kovac? So, so things are changing. So when we, when we speak, so I listened the other day uh, to a speech which was given by George Schultz in 2012 at Stanford University. And he spoke about how the Americans organized the world after World War II. He said, so the global commons, we, the World Bank, IMF, Bretton Woods, and so on and so forth. The, the, the world was designed the American way, the Western way. So we are accustomed to, we as Westerners, mm -hmm. we're accustomed to looking at things from Western perspective. And suddenly we understand that 30% of the world community has some kind of sympathy for the Russians in this war against Ukraine. Inside our society. In, inside, yeah. I mean, I mean in, in the world community, look at the states in the world. So 30%, only 15% of the world community uh, uh, condemns the Russian attack. Only 15%. In, num in numbers of yeah, if, 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 if you count the states which uh, uh, condemn the attack, it's only 15% of, of the states in the world. So things are changing, and these non-important countries in the world, the commerce, China, 
for instance, have become very, very important. Today, you, the, the, Chinese, the Chinese buy more cars than the Americans. So things are changing. That's the first thing. So we have to understand that things are changing and that we have to protect ourselves in a very intelligent manner, speaking of the West. Okay? So we cannot only accept our point of view. We have to understand how they reason, the Chinese, the Indians, and so on and so forth. Second thing, when you come to Europe, uh, um, Jacek, the former uh, Polish uh, foreign minister, spoke about the difference between Poland uh, or, or other Eastern European countries and Eastern Germany. East, so when I spoke, when I speak to my German friends, I tell them, and they, because they have a way of reason when it comes to international politics, European politics, uh, Eastern, Eastern Europe is different. They have to change. I said, but you're the only country in the European Union which has some kind of Eastern Europe in its stomach. It is Eastern Germany. It's different because of the history. People have different ways of looking at things. Germany, Dortmund, or Köln is closer, the way of thinking, to Nijmegen or to, to Rotterdam, uh, to Lyon, then to Leipzig, to uh, Warsaw, or to Zagreb or Ljubljana, because of the people being different. There's basically no immigration. There is some immigration, but not comparable to the Western European countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and so on and so forth. So we have to understand that for cohesion, for having a real cohesion in Europe, we have to understand the needs of the people in Eastern Europe. And the people in Eastern Europe have to understand the differences in Western Europe, and when it comes to the West, we have to understand that we have to stick together to protect ourselves in the long run when it comes to this confrontation with China and other non-Western powers. Brief reaction? Yeah, and on this description of Germany, I think it's not quite true. The majority of the Germans and also the majority of the young people in Eastern Germany are really thinking in Western categories. We have a generational issue, and uh, I think you, as coming from a former Warsaw Pact country, will understand that. The East Germans didn't have the advantage of the Poles to be German nationals. Mm. In an occupied uh, Soviet system, they had only one chance to be the best non-Soviet communists which existed in the Warsaw Pact. So they forgot the German identity. And that is what still is alive among the older generation in Eastern Germany. But the younger generation is not thinking in that way. They're not dreaming of a return of the Russians. They are very happy that the Russians are gone. No, I wouldn't say, if, if I may say something, so I wouldn't say, dear general, that the people are dreaming of coming, of seeing the Russians back, because they were against the Russians at the time of the GDR, many of them. I would say that it is... It is uh, also, to a huge proportion, a way of protesting, of being, of showing a dissatisfaction with uh, the transition. So they are losers of the transition, and that's it, basically. But you need to understand uh, what what happened to the Eastern East Germans. We imposed on yes, on, the, on them something yes, that's what I'm saying. which was not known to them. That's what I'm saying, um, and. Suddenly, for this generation, a world fell into pieces. And the new system was not obvious uh, uh, of an advantage in the first instance. They lost their jobs. They, they were, all what they had done before was meaningless. And that, I think, is some difficult to digest. So this is a main line of class of civilization through Germany, isn't it? <laughs> or so it between civilization. Well, uh, let's move to uh, the, the next point, and that is uh, within this uh, point that we initially asked ourselves whether or not, uh, what, what are the, the dividing lines, if you will, between BRICS countries to the G7? Um, to what degree is this also within the context of strategic power competition? where Europe, as a secondary actor within the Western camp, is trying to find its own footing, 
But at the same time, it realizes that it needs to secure its blockchains. It needs to secure the, the interests of its own people as well within various nation states, including the 27 member states of the European Union, but also Great Britain, of course, and others. To what degree do we see today a reality in which Europe is willing to forgo of value for money, for security for money? Well, I don't see that Europe will forgo value for money. What, what we w uh, would like to do is to secure a place in a new global order in which we can promote as much well-being and as much peaceful cooperation as possible. But we need to understand that some are challenging the, the really iron principle on which everything after World War II in Europe rested. And that was the, the concept that a border should never be changed by the use of force. And if now the Chinese and, the, and others promote this idea that uh, territorial integrity means nothing and you can change it by the use of force, then they are about to enter the world in which the law of the jungle will prevail. There Europe has to stand up against, against, and we have to defend the principle that the rule of law is the dominating factor and we have to secure our place in the world for that principle. And if it is challenged, we have to be prepared to use force as well. Well, let me maybe sharpen this uh, point uh, a little bit, because Germany, until the, the invasion of Russia into Ukraine, was very dependent on Russia for energy and, and uh, other resources. Today, we have the European Union moving the entire 27-member uh, bloc to 2035, where cars on uh, the basis of CO2 emissions will not be permitted to be sold anymore within the continent. Three components, three minerals of those batteries that allow those cars to function, the electric cars to function, are imported, 70% one of those components, from China. Meaning, does not the entire logistical system of the entire continent of Europe now forcibly going to rely on China for its own logistics and freedom of movement? Professor? Uh, that's right, that's right. So Europe is dependent, and I think there is a thinking in the European Union, in main countries like France particularly, but also Germany, that it should remain in neutral in this competition between China and the United States. Also, there is a dependency on these minerals necessary for uh, development. And there is another different way of thinking, representing by Central European countries where transatlantic relations are crucial. So th this is this divergence uh, within, within, within the European Union, and uh, we'll see what will be the situation. When you look at the opinion polls, so most uh, Europeans are against involvement in this, this discussion between China and uh, the US uh, over uh, Taiwan, and they perceive China as a future perspective partner for Europe, or even necessary partner, as they did uh, with, with Russia uh, previously. So we have to take it. Uh, we, we, in Poland, we do not agree with that policy. We think that uh, solidarity is very important. Transatlantic relations are crucial. We are united. We have common system, common values. We have to de defend these values. But when you look at the uh, at Pres at President Macron, for example, uh, saying that we'll be not involved in this quarrel, so it makes us also thinking about the unity. I, I, I think uh, uh, that uh, Jacek has, has a point. This is, this is pivotal because we have been uh, uh, on the border of the Russia all the time. And uh, Putin fooled everybody. And what I mean... Uh, he spoke in Munich Congress 2007 and said more or less what is going to happen. And nobody believed that he actually can cope the way. It started in Georgia, then there was an invasion in Crimea, and everything went step by step. And we in the West 
we tend to believe because we have abandoned, uh, uh, got rid of our ideological roots, which should be uh, democracy from Greece, a law from Rome, and faith from Jerusalem. But we have put that aside, and we are believing in money and mammon. And in Russia and in China, ideology always beats the money. And in West, we think that the money beats ideology. And we were wrong. Interesting. Professor Kovac? Yes, yes I agree with uh, Tim when it comes to the construct. Our construct, of course, yeah, symbolically, uh, 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 Athens, Rome, Jerusalem. But uh, we are doing everything we can to flee that. So we, 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 yeah. we don't want to assume the foundations of our civilization, in this case, of this European civilization. And that also applies to the U.S. So this is very important to, uh, to state. But um, uh, when it comes to um, Russia, China, and the U.S., so we have a great power competition, which is something uh, which is difficult for us to understand because we're not in the game. We're not Americans. We're not Russians. We're not Chinese. But are the Russians in the game? No, no. The Russians are in the game, still in the game, but um, they have something in common with the Chinese. The South China Sea is a territory which is claimed by the Chinese. And they're also not respecting the sovereignty of other nations because they say it's our territory. It's belo it belongs to us. So no one speaks about it. So they have something in common, they have common interests. And that's it basically. So we have to understand that this competition will continue. We have to do everything we can to impose the idea of law being the, 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 the chief principle to be respected. But there's something above the law, and that is national interests in a world dominated by, by nation states and Beyond the na uh, 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 above the nation states, there's nothing. So let me ask you this about the transatlantic alliance, which we uh, provided a lot of time at the beginning of this program to discuss. Europe is quite adamant, taking France out of the equation, to maintain and even bolster the transatlantic alliance when it comes to security guarantees of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Europe. But when it comes to choosing within strategic uh, power competition, which the Americans are quite frankly demanding to a certain degree and, and are even expanding on more and more as time progresses, Europe doesn't seem to want to oblige. Uh, Europe lives in some kind of uh, post-political uh, world, in some kind of Kantian paradise, and that's the problem. Some kind of Kantian, Immanuel Kant, paradise. Okay? But we're living in a world dominated by nation states, so their interests. And uh, we have to protect ourselves, and we have to do much more together in Europe for the security of the European continent, together with the Americans. So this is the only recipe if in the long run we want to co be competitive politically and economically. Uh, uh, if we don't do that, we will be the losers in the long run. General? Well, I think we, with all due respect for the national uh, idea and national identity, uh, I think we Europeans need to understand we have to work together in order to, to play a role in this world. Absolutely. And understanding that we alone are too weak to get anything done. We need to understand that we have to be on the side of the Americans because we depend on them. But for three consecutive administrations in Washington, we had, and it started with the Biden administration, the whole concept of leading from behind, which ultimately uh, saw an increase of isolationists within the Democratic Party, which was usually more of a globalist in, in essence, which then impacted more and more under the Trump administration and now the Biden administration. It doesn't seem that leadership applies in this right. sense. Jonathan, you, you will understand that the catchword leading from behind makes my hair's raises in the back. And leading from, the, from behind in the military means that you are a coward as a leader. Uh, the, <laughs> as a leader, you have to be 
in front. Otherwise, an infantry company will never follow you. Leaning from behind is a nonsense. That's a political catchword <laughs> which was invented by someone who is not willing to take risks. But didn't this, as a statement, draw in China into an era of strategic competition? We are. In a, we know that we are in an area of, uh, of competition, but we know also that we Europeans, as well as the Americans, depend on the freedom of the high seas. So if the freedom of the high seas is challenged in the South China Sea, it's a matter of our national interest. 44% of the world's trade is going through the Straits of Malacca. If they are blocked, we are out. And the same is emerging in the Arctic Ocean, where it possibly might be ice fry, uh, mm -hmm. in by 2030. Yeah. So if we are not prepared to defend our right of freedom of the high seas, our entire system will collapse. And if the Americans are willing to protect it, we have to be on, on their side. And if necessary, we have to fight on their side. Dear General, if I may say so, the Americans must protect it. Why? Because they are also acting in their own interest. Because if they allow the Chinese to become a regional power, things will significantly change. So the Americans will maintain their presence in that part of the world and try still to control uh, the, uh, uh, the high seas. Yeah. Or the cost yeah. of... But, yeah. but we depend on, on trade and export as well. Yes. And it goes across the sea, not across land. Absolutely. Professor uh, Chaputovich, I'd like to uh, move to another angle of uh, the discussion because ultimately freedom of navigation, there are more and more countries within uh, the China-aligned uh, nation, including the Islamic Republic of Iran and uh, uh, like-minded nations that are threatening freedom of navigation, also in the Strait of Hormuz and uh, Babel Mandeb and other areas uh, that are crucial not only for uh, vital minerals, uh, including crude oil, to a third of the world uh, in that part of the globe. To what degree do you see a, a joint European effort beyond what is currently being implemented by the British and French and others here in the continent to try and bolster uh, certain presence in other regions and projecting power to a certain degree? I think that there is an understanding within Europe that we have to be united as we face external uh, competitors or actors like China and there is a willingness in uh, Central Europe to support Germany, other countries to have common policy vis-a-vis -vis these actors because we are too weak as uh, singular countries uh, to face that, uh, that, that ch uh, ch uh, challenge. Uh, China had a very good format for coping with Central European countries. It was 16 plus 1, then 17 plus 1. Uh, China wanted to divide European Union to have a um, special agreement on one hand with Central European countries and with the Western, but we thought it was the wrong policy. We should be more united. We should give uh, uh, power to European Commission or to European uh, 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 institutions to represent interests of, of, of Europe. For the moment that we see a problem, a bit of, uh, that some leaders like President Macron, sometimes uh, uh, Chancellor Scholz, re represent Europe in relations with these countries. It, uh, because the European institution is abusing its powers. Uh, no, I think because they want to do it, they want to strengthen their political position to represent themselves as uh, European leaders. But as we can accept uh, Michel or von der Leyen as a European leader, uh, I mean we, Poland, a European leader that they speak on our behalf, we cannot accept uh, uh, leaders of other countries that they represent uh, Poland. So this is uh, also a problem within the European Union. Like Normandy format vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Russia, created by countries France and Germany, they did not represent European Union. If it is a European Union there, then we would have accepted that because we have influence, we elect them. So sometimes, and this is the problem with the leadership with the European Union, that sometimes politicians 
try to simply represent without formal power and it weakens European institutions. Of course, countries like China understand that and they prefer to talk to France, to Germany, not to the European Union as united mm -hmm. because for them it will be more difficult if there's a common position. Indeed. Mr. Yeah, yeah uh, both Russia and China have the same approach, individual country, bilateral, because they are always bigger than, uh, than uh, one of us, but the uh, European Union is bigger than them, mm -hmm. not, uh, not by population to China, but uh, in, in many cases. And I want to raise, because General Nauman said about the high seas, uh, Finland were, was the chairman of the Arctic Council 2018 and 19, when I was happy to, to chair it. And it is a concept of all the Nordic countries, Canada, US and Russia. And it was very important. Now it's paralyzed because of this war. And China showed a tremendous interest on that. And like uh, General Nauman said, the South China Sea is essential. But what is really emerging is the Arctic seas and Arctic uh, routes when the ice would be gone. And there is a huge interest, and I hope that the European Union pays real interest and gives the support to the Nordic countries because this is their alternative route to the world. Indeed. But also important for Russia, Timo, because they transport their liquefied natural gas through that, through that uh, uh, route, the, 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 uh, the Russians. Huh? So uh, it, because the way towards Europe becomes shorter. Yeah? And the Chinese could also use it uh, uh, and, and, and avoid uh, the South uh, China Sea for transport towards yeah, Europe. So, yeah, yeah. so the Russians are once again in a, in, in a strong position when it comes uh, to that. But when speak, speaking about Europe, so there are two domains in which we have to be much more efficient. All to, I agree with you. We have to work together much more efficiently. But we should not. Uh, now we have a compromise when it comes to migration. Okay, It took... Some years. Seven years. Seven years. Okay. <laughs> Seven years. And in the end, we are altogether tougher. So even the Greens in Germany accepted uh, that we have to be tougher together, that we, have to, that we have to work together when it comes to illegal migration. But um, Is it not too late, though? It's never too late. Yeah. That's an optimist. Uh, okay. Defense policy, defense policy, and energy policy. This is today with energy policy, we have to work together to ensure in the long run our self-sufficiency when it comes to energy. So uh, the, um, uh, the use of and, and the import uh, of, of energy and defense policy. So if you ask a Hungarian or a Pole or, 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 Pol or someone from Estonia, from Finland, from Croatia, from Germany, he would say, yes, we agree to work together when it comes to defense policy. Let's do that together. Let us uh, con concentrate on defense policy, not on gender issues, but on defense <laughs> policy, on things that are important to our societies. Okay, this is how we should we should take the minimal consensus and to, to work together and to show that we are efficient. Well, a point that we did not discuss, and uh, I'd like to move on to that, General, if uh, I may, and that is the conflict in Russia, uh, the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine on the 5th of this month. Uh, Ukraine started its counteroffensive. Not much information coming out of there. Nevertheless, it seems to be quite a challenge, uh, to say the least. General, if, if I may ask, start with you on this, to what degree does Ukraine have a chance to prevail at a time when it doesn't have uh, the consensus number of forces uh, necessary in an offensive to beat the defensive military. Nevertheless, the Russians seeking to push forward themselves are not necessarily in a cohesive defensive posture, if you will. Well, uh, very difficult for me to assess. I do not have much information, as you. Uh, I admire the gallant fighting of the Ukrainians, but I know from past experiences that nothing is as difficult as to attack against uh, a fortified position if you do not have overwhelming uh, numerical and material superiority, which the Ukrainians do not have. And they do not 
uh, have air superiority, which is also a big disadvantage in such a fight. So uh, I simply cannot give you a, a clear-cut assessment. I simply know too little about the situation on the ground to tell you they will succeed or they will not succeed. Um, I suspect at the end of the day we may see a repetition of the war of attrition which we have seen over the winter. Professor Czafutowicz? So I, it looks like the uh, situation is uh, quite difficult. It's, very, it's much easier to defend fortified positions than to attack. You need much more forces, and it proves that there is advantage of defensive these, these days. Uh, I think that maybe it was um, a mistake on the Western side just to press, uh, to express expectation from Ukrainians to make this counteroffensive. Would be better maybe to give more, more time for the Ukrainians and uh, not to wait for quick sol a solution of that, uh, of, of that conflict. So, Did signs of Western fatigue drive the counteroffensive at this stage? I think that politicians want to have some results. They say, okay, we, we provide you with the weapons. Just, we have to demonstrate to our society that it is worth uh, investment. Uh, and it was also in the United States. The politicians want to have results before the election, particularly. That they want to prove. And there are questions. Is it worth to be involved for that of, of, from the side of societies, Western societies. It is kind of a maybe fatigue, but I think we have to mobilize um, international societies, societies in these countries and accept that this conflict m m may last and the, the chance for the West is superiority, technological superiority, but also sanctions if they are introduced, then... Uh, Then, then Russia will have difficulty with the, with the, with the investment, with modernizing their system. At the same time, they are, I mean, I'm talking about Russians getting experience. Uh, uh, they modernize their army. They are prepared to fight. They uh, adapt to that situation and they gain advantage over NATO countries, which live uh, in, uh, in, in peaceful times and they don't conduct the war. So this is a real problem for NATO. So the solution would be, again, maintain sanctions and have a policy for a long run and maybe mobilize international community, countries like India and maybe China might be more neutral on taking into consideration other countries. And I see on the side of the Uh, United States visit uh, of Secretary Blinken to China, uh, talks with other countries, that maybe it's uh, this way of thinking. Interesting. Mr. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, important to understand that this may be a long uh, conflict that we can, uh, we can uh, anticipate. And when we got rid of COVID, which was very hard Uh, hit uh, to our societies economically and mentally and everything else. And it was ended uh, in a one and a half years in a way and people moved on. Now we have another conflict which is now one and a half year old. We have been uh, uh, supportive. We have uh, suffered uh, the price of gas and oil and electricity, food, higher interest and inflation for one and a half years. And combined with COVID and this, it's three years of battle. How long people can take it? And, and of course, my perception is that we should carry on. We must be supported because it's, it's about our democracy too. But I think what we will see in the European Union elections are the rising voices to challenge this. That's why we have to sacrifice everything because of somebody else. And I think this is a dangerous concept, but I can see it coming and I can easily see Russia, China having a cyber hybrid uh, propaganda issues to put pressure on that in the Western societies. Professor Kovac. Uh, when it comes to um, the sanctions, the sanctions do not really harm the Russian economy. 
the first uh, sanctions, 2014-15, have helped the Russians to become self-sufficient in agricultural uh, products. So the hypothesis is that in seven to ten years, they will become much more autonomous when it comes to technology. Hmm? So the sanctions do not work. Secondly, uh, the uh, Czech uh, President Pavel, General Pavel said to the Ukrainians a month ago, do not launch an offensive before you're not really ready. Hmm? So, uh, and third, I think the Ukrainians have to continue to fight to uh, regain their territories. It's going to be a long war. Long war. This war resembles World War One. Diplomacy is off the table. No, no. But uh, when it comes to Ukraine, so the perspective has to be changed. The Ukrainians um, do not control twenty percent of the territory, but the rest, eighty percent, has not been captured by the Russians. So the idea must be: this is uh, the basis for a new project. We're going to turn this country into a Western-style country. It's going to be a true democracy, a country uh, ruled by the principles of freedom and the rule of law. Uh, we're going to make a success story. We're going to rebuild the country. We're going to get, get money from the opinion from the Western societies to make this to make this a success story. We have the Poles as neighbors. The Poles are a success story. So this has to be the idea. So we have to change the perspective. We will continue to fight for the rest of the territories which are not controlled by us. But the shift has to be made. No, not a shift on this offensive if you're not ready for an offensive. Not a, to run an offensive because of an offensive. Yeah? The offensive, when you launch an offensive, it has to be efficient. Whatever you do, don't speak about it before you run that offensive. Yeah. General? Uh, I fully agree with Timo uh, that the most important thing we in the West have to do is to maintain cohesion and the support for Ukraine. If we fail to do that, Putin and China will have won. And another point where I, if I probably I misunderstood you, uh, where I would uh, clearly say we can never accept that a square inch of Ukrainian territory will be given to Russia as a result of the war. If we accepted this, we would give up forever the, I should say, the principle that territories cannot be taken by force. And that is the beginning of the world of the jungle. For that reason, we have to stick to this principle, whatever it will take. And I take the example of the Baltic countries. My country never accepted the occupation of the Baltic countries by the Soviet Union. Germany and I think the United States were the only ones who never accepted it. History told us that we were on the right track and we will be on the right track in Ukraine as well. We have to be patient but we have to stay the course. They will not accept it. Uh, uh, this is true. I'm, I'm speaking about psychologists. So the French never accept the loss of Alsace-Lorraine. Huh? Mm. They, for 50 years, they fought and built a new generation of politicians to retake it. So, but they, did, they, did, they, did, they didn't hinder them from developing their country. So I'm saying that the Ukrainians they will continue to fight for the country, which is <laughs> occupied, partially, but they have to, we have to, we have to because of uh, uh, a success story, psychologically speaking, we have to focus on what has already been achieved, and that is 80% of the territory is not controlled by the Russians. With that being said, of course, the influx of illegal migration, even though you're optimistic about uh, this latest deal. Uh, I'm not optimistic, I'm just realist. Oh, uh, realist, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, in order to defend one's nation, uh, the nation's uh, cohesiveness, at least culturally speaking, is vital. And uh, in today's reality, we saw it in Ukraine, we see it in other places. Uh, the will to fight is diminishing in Europe, and it seems that there are implications to that on uh, uh, future terms of what Europe may withstand. But I like to stay optimistic about this as well. Uh, General Nauman, uh, we'll start with you about uh, where... Are we heading in the near future? We have uh, just a couple of sentences for each and every one of you. I think what we have to do is to tell our people, I'm speaking of course as a German, we have to tell our people that the happy days of a comfort, uh, comfortable life without doing anything for anyone 
are over. We have to stand, we have to fight, we have to prepare, uh, have to be prepared to defend our system of values, and if necessary, we have to fight for that. Professor Chabotovic? I agree. I, I see the growing unity within the European Union vis-a-vis -vis challenges uh, supporting Ukraine, and this is the hope that the European Union will maintain this unity. Also, there is an understanding of maintaining transatlantic links due to our, our, our security. And I observe also kind of an integration of the European Union, definitely with the hope of enlargement to Ukraine and maybe Moldova, Balkan countries. So closer positions of countries vis-a-vis -vis these challenges as at the beginning of war. We need, we need some success stories and success comes by work and recognizing our roots. We have a great history, we have a good uh, uh, roots. Let's uh, respect them and show to the world that this is the way to go. Professor Kovac, you should assume our legacy. We should um, reinforce uh, our cooperation in the uh, essential domains. And we have to believe in, uh, in our uh, possibilities to stay the most innovative parts of the world, meaning the, uh, the American continent and the European continent. Well, that's all the time there for, uh, for today. I'd like to thank General Nauman, Professor Chaputovic, Mr. Soini, and Professor Kovac for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until next time, from me here in Helsinki, good evening. The Middle East, home to the cradle of civilization, retains a reputation from time immemorial as one of the most complex, conflict-ridden regions of the world. A cluster of nations, religions, powers and influences, Mideast intricacies pose conundrums to even the most astute individuals. Bombarded daily, indeed every minute, by a barrage of information, some accurate, yet most of it less so. TV7 Israel invites you to watch and hear some of the most knowledgeable experts, most of who partook in creating policies shaping this region today. Join us for Jerusalem Studio every Tuesdays and Fridays for content that truly matters.